I'm honored to be joined today by Dr. Lee Cronin. He's a professor and chair of chemistry at the University of Glasgow, where he does chemistry research and research on the chemical origins of life, and also recently published a very impactful paper in Nature on assembly theory, which we're going to be talking about today. Lee, welcome to the Nature and Nurture podcast. Nice to meet you. Nice to be on. I'll meet you again. Yeah, you spoke at Harvard. You you gave a pretty broad overview of the theory. So what is it? What is assembly theory? Um, assembly theory is a theory that explains how causation in the universe gives rise to selection and how selection gives rise to ultimately function or survival. So it's almost like the selfish gene, but it has to start with, a se with selfish matter. And so selfish matter wants to exist or persist. And the problem is you can think of the universe as basically bringing together things that are being made, but they get destroyed by erosion or entropy time, right? And so how is it that complex objects can persist in time? You either have to make, uh, you know, you go in a graveyard and you see gravestones and yes, you, you can see the really, the people, richest people have got their, you know, granite brick gra gravestones or stone ones that have washed away. Even the most expensive ones over time are eroded. Now, the kind of gravestone that one needs is one that self-replicates and copies itself and renews itself with a matter that keeps its full. And uh, that's what life is. And assembly theory was meant to kind of bridge the gap. It's a very simple, very humble undertaking, actually, between physics and chemistry and biology. So they're kind of interested. So there's a gap between physics and chemistry, and there's a gap between chemistry and biology. And I kind of didn't really understand that the various disciplines didn't understand. And so the question, so assembly theory is meant to, first of all, just quantify selection in a fairly agnostic way and and that helps us explain how um chemistry becomes biology that's cool and then even more fundamentally it helps understand how selection operates in physics and how physics becomes more complex chemistry so you bridge these two gaps um, and assembly theory just allows you to quantify it by going backwards that's kind of the essence it's a very simple theory um and it just says it basically in a nutshell if I was going to give it in, in one sentence, history matters to matter. So if history matters to matter, it shapes the future of matter in the dynamic environment. And that's all assembly theory does. And it's kind of obvious. It's a theory of everything? No, it's not a theory of everything. It can't be a theory of everything. But it's certainly a theory of um, selection. And certainly selection has created and I use that word advisedly, you know, with a caution that the process of selection has caused the generation of complexity and biology and culture and computers and everything. So it's, it's pretty broad, but it's not everything. Right. Well, I don't know anything about chemistry, Lee, and yet this was fairly digestible to me, which I took as a good sign. And I think it's because I'm really interested in evolutionary game theory and computational neuroscience. And what I think all of this has in common with assembly theory is they're all something like theories of information processing. Does that sound right? Yeah, I mean, exactly. There's, there's a lot of confusion of information processing in biology right now. And assembly theory starts to, to, to address that um, gently because there's a great, you know, um, area of, of complexity in computer science, but that is misused in biology and in technology a bit, because we talk about Shannon entropy and common goal of complexity, these terms in computer science, and we kind of misappropriate them as we go into biology. And, but complexity is important and it's complex, um, but computational complexity is well-defined. Complexity in biology and neuroscience is not well-defined and it's a super exciting function. It's a problem. How can I measure the complexity of your brain at, say, if you had a twin brother compared to his brain? Or take any person with a mass of the brains are identical. Which brain is more complicated? 
the one that, that if you've got exactly the same number of electrons and things in the brain, but yet one person has more memories objectively and can write more stuff. And how do you, how do you actually get to that? And that's because we have to do something more than think of the brain as a information processing system. It's like a computer. It has parallels, but, but anyway, I agree with you. It's really, there are really interesting frontiers and like think that assembly theory will provide help with complexity in biology right up to neuroscience and computational neuroscience where computational complexity in and biological complexity meet and we need to understand how to bridge that gap you have this very digestible example in the paper of the word abracadabra and i guess here the sim uh the syllables in the word are stand-ins or i guess they could be different molecules or really any different repeating pattern of information. And one example here is the Abra is there twice, right? So you don't need to store Abra, Cad, Abra. You can store something like Cad and Abra times two, right? And it's almost like memory retrieval. So this is yeah. where it starts to get more almost like a cognitive theory. At least that's how I naturally read these things. But I know you're talking about chemistry. So how does it apply to molecules? Well, I, I kind of, I think it's interesting thinking about cognitive theory, um, and you might want to explain to what you mean, but in a way, I wonder if the way that, and let's not think about molecules, so we'll go there. It's a good question, but stuff interacting, um, in the environment and persisting, if the form, if there's a reflection of one form in the other and it can see itself, take it's very, it's very, you know, it's a very weird analogy for the moment. But you can almost have the oscillation between the two forms as a kind of learning process. And you can view the, the, the interaction of molecules and complex systems as a kind of chemical cognition. But I wonder if I'm using words in stupid ways. But coming back to your question about abracadabra and molecule, I think it is a good, it's, a, it's an interesting thing. Because if you take it apart, what we say in assembly theory, which is different to computational theory, right? I think mean, there's a lot of, well, there's not, there's one or two individuals who are being, who are being very, who are just basically saying, who are, who are denying this paradigm for various reasons. And when you, because in computer science, when you compress the word abracadabra, you don't care about the actual, um, the causation of the letters coming. You just have access to everything and you have some kind of lookup tape. But if you think about how you create abracadabra, just from, let's say you start at the bottom of the tree of abracadabra, you just have letters. And you have, and what you do is you basically have to build, take an A and then, a, and then you add on a B. So that, that is a, that is a distinct object you have to join together and then carry on. And as you're right, because you've made Abra before, when you need to make the last part, you say, oh, I don't need to make that again. That object exists before. I'll just use it again with only a penalty of one in my assembly tray. And then in the Abracadabra. The significance is the join between the letters. The A is connected to the B. In the molecule, we, we use bonds. So if one atom is glued onto another atom, a carbon is joined to a nitrogen. That bond connects it intimately, and you can, can carry on, and you can carry on to DNA. Um, and I suppose, in a way, anywhere where there's a memory stored, information stored at whatever level of the hierarchy, if that memory is causal uh, um, in the environment, then it's used in assembly theory. So the nice thing is assembly theory is a theory of causation that is validated in molecules, but can apply to cells, tissues, language, consciousness, technology. But you have to use it at the display. And one of the interesting things we're trying to battle with right now is, or conceptualize is how to robustly use the theory at each level of emergence without mixing up layers so we don't lose the predictive and explanatory power. I don't know if I drifted off in asking your question. Well, this is all in the context of the origins of life. Tell me if I'm misrepresenting anything, but this is how I've been thinking about it. So you have some chemical soup in the Earth's early oceans, and each of the different chemicals might be like different letters in this context. You have A, B, C, D, there's an R in there as well. And these are all just floating around. And abracadabra is something really complicated like DNA. And then the fragments of that would be something like amino acids that later assemble into DNA. So that would be like an abra or a cad. And 
when people are talking about the very, very low probabilities of how can you get complex life or forms like DNA in this chemical soup when it's just single letters bouncing across hitting each other, how are they going to combine into something so big and complicated? And you're saying you don't have to jump straight to abracadabra. You can start off with getting some abs. And then once there's a stable process making abs, you can get abras, you can get cads. And once there are already abras, it's not even creating a new word twice the length. It's just repeating something that's there already. Yeah, that's right. And there's two other, there's two additional properties there because at the end, in a way, assembly theory is disassembly theory because you're like, oh, I know there's abracadabra and there's lots of copies. Why is that selected over all the others? Well, abracadabra obviously had a function in our cultures, like abracadabra, right? But it, these molecules would have a function in terms of causing a cell to be stable or perhaps having some energy. And what you do is the, the process produces the abracadabra is somehow um, stabilized and maintained in steps and the system can add bits on. Now at the fundamental basis in the origin of life, this happened you had, you could get complexity without replication to start with, or, or very complicated copying, just simple copying. And then when the simple copying allowed these little motifs to be made, the, say the bra or the abra or whatever, as long as those small, smaller fragments could have some kind of function to keep the object persisting in time, so it survived or the fittest then it would be promoted to the next generation. And then there would be other events where there would be mutations and collisions and other processes. And you can see step by step by step, you build up the processes that support the construction of this complicated object. And so abracadabra is a simple example, but you could think of many other. Now, when you're looking in the ocean or you're looking at, say, in the origin of life, or you're looking for anything for selection, if you could imagine that there's a letter generator, sorry, a word generator, just taking, you know, anything per se between one and 20 letters and putting them together at random, you can find abracadabra easy, but that isn't evidence of selection. If you start to in this soup where you've got all these A, B, C, Z, Z, Y, whatever, if you find one abracadabra, and then you find another one and another one and a copy number. If you were to look at all the words in the ocean, uh, the ones that, uh, and you were to find, you know, uh, words that have number of identical copies, you know, there is a process that made them that is non-random as long as the complexity of the word is quite high above a threshold. Because if it was just ABBA, ABBA is probably easy to get a lot of copies of ABBA, just, you know, because it's just like four letters, it's just two Bs and two A's and fine. But as soon as you go beyond the threshold, you're like, oh, hang on. It's a bit like if I was to write you a secret message or put a load of, you know, at what point would you, you would think the message, there was meaning in the message? Well, you'd have to find copies. So it's not just these letters. There's the fact you have to have discover these repeaters. And all assembly theory did is like say, oh my gosh, there are complicated molecules we can find in identical, there's large numbers of them and they couldn't have formed by chance. How do they, how do they get there? And the only process that can make that complexity is biology. Um, and it's the same, and, and, and the, I think as you go up the hierarchy and you end up with memes, like memes are the, for me, the best example of, or not the best example, but a really digestible example of how assembly theory can apply in abstractions and how they're copying it. Richard Dawkins has already done all the work for memes that copy themselves. Um, but assembly theory explains those as well. Right, that's where it starts to sound really cognitive because then you can have, well, you could have just chemicals bouncing around in the ocean or any random environment, but then you get agents and origins of life. Those chemicals start to become not just passive, but active agents. And then that's mm -hmm. almost more into biology. I don't know if it's worth going there here. Yeah, no, I think it's a hierarchy, right? And I think the thing, I mean, I'm glad that you're able to find the paper readable because I, I got so much criticism, but not from, I would say, not from people who were just read the paper, open mind said, oh, I'm going to read the paper. Even so there was dedicated scientists who were quite dogmatic, read the paper and hated it. Said we didn't understand anything. It's nonsense. And I was, so I, 
I had two types of response to that paper. It's complete nonsense. Uh, well, or, oh, I actually quite understood it. I didn't expect to, oh, I, I don't understand it all because there's some features, but the general, you know, the general concept and the, and the bottom line is it's just such a simple concept. It's just the correlation matters. And so when did you go to biology? I suppose if you go back to the last universal common ancestor, let's say what I'm trying to do is understand the mystery of sand to cells. Everyone says it's a mystery. It's completely, you know, it's the intelligent design. People say, look, it's evidence of God. The origin of life, people say, no, it's just that all these processes, we try and make them. The physicists say we don't care, the initial conditions, you know, and, and the biologists kind of didn't even, don't even really, the evolutionary biologists are so um, clear about how evolution works in biology. They don't even stop for a second to say, how did evolution start before biology? And so one of the things I've been trying to do is going, going from biology up and then ending up going into language and cognition is actually not trivial, it's hard, but I think it's understandable because you've got layers, right? You've got, you've got, I can show you, you know, if I can show you uh, cells replicating, then I show you a multicellular creature, then I show you animal, you know, fish, animals, um, um, primates, primates with primitive language tools, because the actual, the ability of the primate to then invent abstraction and then invent language, and then over a network of people invents consciousness. Consciousness was not invented in one brain. It was invented in a network of brains to end survival, probably. Then you get, then you go up these layers. But going back to this kind of transition to biology, it's so difficult for people to understand selection operates before evolutionary biology that it caused everyone just to basically kind of just literally divide by zero when they saw that. Um, but I think understanding biology with it makes a great deal of sense because of the speciation in evolution. There are some interesting features of, Dar of Darwinian evolution I want to explore with assembly theory. Um, there are obviously two different types of evolution. There was Lamarckism, which is basically organisms could and learned experience could affect the evolution. And, that, and, and, and Darwinian evolution is just survival of fitness by random selection. But actually, there's Lamarck, Lamarckian processes aren't true. They don't work. But at the origin of life, there had to be some Lamarckism in a way. And I'm still trying to explain that with assembly theory. And also when you move between the layers, when you go from cells to tissues, tissues to organisms, organisms to abstraction, abstractions to consciousness, consciousness to technology and intelligence, something interesting happens because now you could say, oh, I'm not satisfied with my genetic machinery. I'm going to alter myself and I might alter my, my germline so that my kids will have this adaptation. And then you could be the first ever Lamarckian dark, Darwinian person, because you have the intelligence, the cognition to build your own uh, DNA modification using CRISPR, give it to yourself, and then away you go. So we're kind of, kind of entering a really interesting idea that when you move between the levels of emergence, you're able to do something even, even more interesting than what was predicted by evolution alone. That's a very profound question that where did selection come from in the first place before biology? And I'm wondering if it has something to do with this entropy idea, because that's an even more universal law, second law of thermodynamics. And then Schrodinger famously defined life as a system that is self-organizing and anti-entropic, not like it's breaking the law, but that it's consuming energy from outside the system to withstand energy or entropy and decay within the system. and some neuroscientists also have used this concept of entropy or com computer scientists as well in kind of a more abstract way, like entropy is just a form of complexity. So just random scribbles on the keyboard is full entropy. And then any repeated patterns, it's almost like you can store it in a variable form. You can store abra and then they ab the abracadabra complexity is reduced by half because you pretty much just repeat what you already have. And that's about as far as I got piecing those together. But I'm wondering, is there something about 
that entropy mechanism. Oh yeah, one more thing actually. So entropy, life is anti-entropic. And even though it's not breaking the real law of entropy, not only is it just like it's a zero-sum trade-off, like the life is consuming energy outside the system, and that's what makes up for the relative decrease in entropy within the system, but it actually seems to accelerate it. Like if you imagine, well, humans are an obvious example, right? We create a whole bunch of order in the world, but we're also burning up fossil fuels in a way that the stored potential energy was there, but it would have taken probably billions of years to release naturally. And now we just burn it and we're increasing entropy way faster on a global scale relative to the order that we're producing in the world, the information that is still negative entropy. So there's a lot. Have, um, I, I, I used to be a fan of entropy and complexity, but it's not enough. It's a hint. And I actually think you don't actually need the second law if you do this properly. But we need it right now. We need a crutch because we need to understand. Let's take Schrodinger's first and also what is life. And so there's a fundamental problem with that. In this idea life is characterized by a reduction of entropy and production of entropy. Um, you have many physical systems that, do that aren't alive from, from, from uh, the formation of snowflakes to burning to flames. And the problem is that people kind of get confused by this free energy principle and this kind of using the tools of thermodynamics that are kind of giving a hint at the structures that an assembly theory gives through selection. And so what we've got is we've got this kind of hybrid, inconsistent theory that has emerged. I have to be careful saying that because, I mean, like assembly theory is not that old and uh, entropy has been around for a while, but it's worth thinking about what entropy allowed us to do. The nice thing is when people started to build steam engines, they're like, I need a piston and they maximize surface area of this. And they realized by building the steam engine and they maximizing the temperature difference between the coldest part and the hottest part, they could attract more efficiency. And the theory of heat and therefore entropy there was brilliant in thermodynamics. So certainly right now using statistics, thermodynamics and an understanding the production and reduction of entropy is well understood. But what you do when you, when you do this is you course, you lose information. So if I basically got two books and let's say I've got two books that got equal numbers of letters, but they say different words. And let's say one book is written in French and one is, I know people, French people tell me off now, one is in English. Now the, fr the French language is very rich. The let number of letters to give meaning is a little bit long. So the actual meaning in the French book will be, you can say less because it, it, it just requires more letters. And so the entropy of the French book is larger than the English book. Actually, I guess I mean, it could be the way around, but let's just say that maybe we should kind of denationalize it because that's probably bad. But, but anyway. Now, the way you can tell the difference is just burn both the books and you do calorimetry. So you put the, the, you put the, you put the book inside a bar in a calori in a calorimeter, burn it, and then just measure precisely all the energy that comes out. Same with the other book. And one will give out more energy than the other. And you can say, oh, that one's, you know, more information, more entropy. But to work that out and destroy the book, you burn everything. And so this is a problem I've had for a while and you have to do that. And then in entropy, when you look at entropy stages, you have to label the beginning and the end state. The observer has to interact with the system. And that makes me feel deeply uncomfortable. And I still don't know what that means yet. But what assembly theory does is says, oh, you don't need to call screen anymore. You need to write down the history so you know everything what's happened. And so there is some relationship between uh, assembly and entropy, there is some, uh, um, and I pretty much worked out the relationship. And when you coarse grain the entry, the assembly in a box and remove the causal structures, you can get entropy out. But when you take a box that you know, well, how much entropy is in it, you can't reproduce the structure, the causal structures. So it's kind of a one, one way thing. So there is a relationship. And what I'm kind of understand, wanting to understand is, 
is entropy a meta this is like gonna get me in so much trouble i'm just making it up but i'm guessing it is is entropy just a meta heuristic for understanding assembly and selection and that's a hell of a thing to say it's like you can have you can have it. the universe has energy and it has entropy it's got nothing to do with selection but i'm just saying well let's think about what we use entropy for and um and boltzmann's formulation you know boltzmann had a really hard time through his life he was had suffered from mental illness he suffered from the fact that people didn't believe that atoms exist and his atomic um, ideas of entropy and i think boltzmann did not finish the entropy story and statistical mechanicists are kind of using the initial conditions um to kind of um to to um to kind of you know do the calculations it's clear that entropy as a concept is super useful for, and for physics and for chemistry and biology it's not clear to me what is the is it the end goal and it explains life and complexity and i think that's where it breaks down and i think a new theory has to step in and i think um, and for now, I'm going to see if assembly theory can do something there. Um, and that and I can go, I can dig quite deep. In, and I'm not saying that entropy is wrong. I'm not saying that. I'm just saying that we're using the principles of entropy to explain really complex phenomena in biology and cognitive science. And I'm not sure that's right. I don't know if you'd call this a paradox, but when I think about a book of finite number of letters, if it's just random gibberish, it's high entropy. And if it's one letter repeated the entire way through, if it's just A's, then you only need to store that and say it's one letter repeating. So it's really low entropy, but it's useless. So there's some moderate amount where moderate entropy seems to be where the interesting complexity is. And then another thing I don't really get, thinking about heat death of the universe, people say, you know, it's, it's just going to keep expanding particles die out, it becomes completely homogenous, but they call that maximum entropy, even though the homogenous book is minimum entropy. Why is that? Yeah, it's completely contradictory, right? So I think that the thing you put out there is really nice. Like you have complete order and complete disorder. Both are not satisfactory in explaining what's going on. You actually find something in the middle. Now, if you use assembly, now let's say your book, rather than your book, got just all A's in it. Let's say that you've got um, um, some A, B's, right? And, there's, and they're split into words. Because now you, can, you have one book that's just A, B's and random spaces, and the book that's got using A, B's to make a primitive language, so there's well-defined spaces. Because you can look at the copy number of the individual me measures, sorry, the individual words and phrases, you start to get assembly out of the book. So you don't just now have a metric of the disorder. You actually have a copy number. And if you have a copy number, that starts to tell you about selection. I think that this is what's really kind of interesting about how assembly theory goes one step than entropy. Because how do you tell the difference between ultimate disorder and ultimate order? You cannot. You cannot unless you have more than one copy. And so if I, if I gave you like, um, I don't know, if you watch uh, what's it, Close Encounters of the Third Kind, and the guy is looking at the TV in the static and he starts to see stuff. Static is just random. But if suddenly the static starts to freeze out and, you know, what is it, 25 frames a second. It's all changing. But suddenly you start to see a pattern in the static. So you get this, you've got this massive grid and black and white dots, squares. And suddenly you start to see order. So the copy number goes up. You're like, oh my gosh, there's no longer random. There is a message here. You're able to see that copy number. And I think the big revelation that I had, if you liked, or realization is probably a better word. So when I was trying to cope with understanding complexity of molecules, everyone would say, oh no, you know, you can, there's a chance of finding a really complex molecule, one off. And I was like, no, no, no. When you detect the molecule, if you detect a complex molecule, you know it's undergone selection. What I failed to convey to people for a very long time is when you, you cannot, it's not possible for chemists to detect one molecule. You have to have many copies, right? Identical copies. And it, it built into my instrumentalist approach was this, uh, was this fact when I was, the signal was in many identical copies, it was a bit like you not just looking in one book for the A's, but looking at many at once. 
And as soon as you start to see many books with the identical message in them, um, you, have a, you can then attribute something else. And that's where assembly theory is coming in. Heat death of the universe, I don't think is a given. I think we don't really understand enough. The second, you know, the, the thing for me is the second law, it's not really a law, is it? It's an observation that we have made and we don't know why. And we have the law of, we have statistical mechanics that it tells us if we run through the simulations, we always get this, this, you know, we don't, eggs don't reform. If you put a colored gas in a room, wouldn't all bow back, it spreads out. But you have to, but you assign the start and the end state and think of the counterfactuals. I think that the concept of entropy requires vision at the very least in light of selection, assembly theory, how to understand complexity outside of computer. Because remember now, when people go to computers, they talk about complexity for two reasons. Number one, they want to know how long it's going to take to run the program. And number two, they need to know how many resources. So this entire field of complexity theory is about resource and time. And then they start to apply entropy and, it comp and then bring in the dynamics. And it all gets a bit confusing. So I don't think we know enough to say the universe is going to end in a heat death. Entropy, that concept seems to require time. And some people say that time is the thing that's actually relative. What do you think there? Well, I think, so. I think, I mean, I'm, I don't know what, yeah, who's, so there are four fallacies. And selection requires time too, I guess. So there are four interesting fallacies for our universe to work, according to the conventional Cameron, right? Number one, at the Big Bang, there was ultimate order. So there was no disorder, perfect order, boom, order is unwinding in the universe. That drug order provides the fuel for everything we see, number one. Number two, there is a second law. And then number three, time is emergent. And number four, causation is emergent. And so what that's basically saying, in a universe where you have a Big Bang order at the beginning, and the laws of physics unfold, there is no causation, no time, and no free will. Because you have a block universe goes boom, all the way out to the infinite universe at the end, where there's no order anymore, and all the atoms are evenly spread out, and nothing happens. So you could just go like a slider, just slide through the space-time slices to any time, and there is no present. You know, we happen to be in a present, but hey, all the presents are talking to each other at all, all the same time, or whatever, right? That clearly is... Um, that, for me, doesn't represent the reality I understand and interrogate. I mean, and maybe I'm fooled as a scientist. So I wonder, and this is kind of a hard one, if basically is actually another way of interpreting this. If time is fundamental in that if the universe is just asymmetric in time, there's a physical thing called time, not just a measurement of time, but there is a, a, a state matrix that's just expanding from which space emerges. And the, and, and the fact that we're saying that the second law, the increased entropy, is just an observation of the universe looks like this in states growing. Now, some people argue, David Deutsch in particular, say you've got an infinite regress there to say your universe has to exist in the universe and exist in the universe, exist in the universe. I don't know about that. All I know is you have to have four beliefs right now if you're a physicist. Big bang order, time emergent, Causation emergent, second law, or you can say one thing, there's time, and you don't need to have any other assumptions. And from time emerges space and everything else. And that to me is makes less um, you know, claims on on artificial reality, which I think is kind of nice. Mm -hmm. I'm not a physicist. I mean, I'm not trained in that way. I'm a chemist trying to make sense of the world in which I'm living and how life emerges so I can find life elsewhere in the universe and make it in the lab. And so it's kind of funny to me that I've kind of gone from, you know, looking at complex molecules to assembly theory, to thinking that entropy is not correct. And then, oh, well, screw it. If entropy is not correct, then time, it has to be fundamental and redoing the state of the universe, which is kind of like, you know, probably not the correct thing to do, but it's fun to think about. I don't know if at your level of analysis in chemistry, Lee, you have to deal with quantum mechanics at all, but I have some questions about that related here. 
And it might be based on a fundamental misunderstanding. So correct me if I sound wrong, but there's this idea of, I don't know what you'd call it, quantum tunneling, where a particle can just jump in and out of existence or teleport in space. And there's, that's probabilistic that it happens. And then my understanding of entanglement is if you start considering multiple particles as a system, the probabilities that they just teleport in or out of existence in pairs gets lower and lower. And by the time you're at levels of, say, a few dozen particles or hundreds or thousands, the probabilities get so low that things are overall pretty stable, where one or two might be popping out. But overall, it's so incredibly unlikely that everything just spontaneously shifts that we see emergent stability. And that's when it moves into classical physics. Does that sound right? I mean, that's one representation of quantum mechanics, but I think the mystery of quantum mechanics is associated with the uncertainty principle, but there doesn't need to, there doesn't need to be an uncertainty principle in principle, right? You know, perhaps if something pops in and out of existence because you are unable to know, look close enough at what's going on in that region of space. And so, and so, and it's kind of like, you know, I, I think. The mathematics generated for quantum mechanics is very good at kind of looking at probabilities and inferring these weird realities. But I'm, I'm wondering, you know, quantum theory gives us very good measurements and we can do very good things. And that's, and there is imprecision. It's not imprecision. There is a lack of information because we can't get information that are very small because of the way we interact as controlled by Heisenberg. And I can't help thinking there's another way of doing it. And so quantum, quantum mechanics cannot be consistent with relativity. There is a mismatch between the two. And I'm just wondering, you know, both quantum mechanics and relativity are two of the most successful theories of all time. Mm -hmm. So it's pretty radical to kind of think about it. But yes, you're quite right. You can, you can observe in experimentally quantum tunneling. You can observe the numbers game. What the, what observations mean about reality is still the subject of much debate, but there's no questioning or no, no, there's, the, the experimental results are, are very um, are well understood. Well, and very well accepted that they're experimental results. Even I've done a quantum entanglement experiment with my colleague, who's a, who's a quantum physicist. And what we did is we did some entanglement to photons to measure the the handedness of the molecule. And normally to measure the handedness of the molecule, you have to use a polarizer. What we did is we actually entangled two photons with different polarizations, and then we're able to use the molecule to interact with the photons and then shift it out and we go, oh, it's that chiral, it's that hand, which I thought was a really good use of, uh, of that um, entanglement, actually. So I, I, I'm, the interpretations of entanglement are kind of, you know, if you take I don't know if you're, if you're aware of the Everettian interpretation of quantum mechanics, the many no. worlds and it, it, quantum mechanics becomes very, very um, elaborate, very quickly. And it is so how bizarre our, our reality is. And I think that it's, uh, it, it's, uh, it would be foolish of me to kind of make any assertions. I'd love to do experiments at the quantum level. I mean, what you're talking about with teleportation and fluctuations. What I would like to know is, can the quantum scale affect decisively the macro scale in terms of symmetry breaking and make, you know, giving, giving, changing, you know, something like causing a crystallization that you have something at the quantum level that in fact gets trapped at the macro level and goes up and up and up, and then you get a, an event happening. And one example could be say, I made a bubble chamber during lockdown. It's like the decay of uranium in the bubble chamber. That's a qu very quantum in nature. It's very probabilistic. And in your bubble chamber, you see these alpha particles come zipping out and you see all the, you see the particle tracks made by ionizing uh, the, the, uh, the alcohol in the air at low dew point. That's kind of cool. So, I mean, it, quantum mechanics is very strange. Um, you can get teleportation, it would appear, and you can get tunneling. But here's how I think it's related to assembly theory. There's this saying of, you know, a monkey typing randomly at a keyboard for infinite time will eventually compile the complete works of Shakespeare. 
but that's only an n of one, right? So if you look at seeing Shakespeare all over the place, then there's some better understanding that there's selection for it. Like maybe there's an intelligence that developed a printing press and we're going out of our way to produce this complicated thing. Whereas even, even if it just pops up an infinite time due to randomness, assembly index would remain low because there's not a lot of copies, right? Okay, so the connection there is imagine something like a heat death state, just very homogeneous universe. The only meaningful interactions going on are just quantum randomness. Well, given infinite time, if they can do these just random teleportations, there's some extremely low probability that everything just randomly condenses into one singularity, right? And then even from that state, there's an extremely low probability that it could stay there indefinitely if there just happens to be no quantum tunneling at all. But then as soon as they start moving, then you get something like entropy. You get something like an explosion into things that are more statistically likely to end up that way. Um, so I, I, so what do you mean that the, the, in the heat death of the universe, there's a probability that the universe will just recon, recompile itself to start again? Is that what you're saying? I think so. So I know, I know that sounds almost kind of, I don't know, just wildly speculative. But no, 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 not at all. Let me interpret it for you. I have a slightly different interpretation that works better. So, um, and it gives you the same thing. Um, it's pretty wild, but as soon as you got, you went there. I don't think you need all that fluctuation at all. I think those fluctuations at infinite time, for me, doesn't make much sense because there's a resource bound issue. But let's think about this. If time is fundamental and space is just the emergence of, of correlation between objects, right? So, um, so you, you have space and you have, you know, Big Bang and everything, planets, people, whatever, TikTok, and then, then the heat death starts. The space that you know about is just, it, it, yes, it's a very big entity because you've filled it with all these causal structures. But as soon as the, the universe becomes so diluted, the causation between any particle ceases, there is no space anymore. Hmm. So it's good to go back to the beginning. So what, so the universe is actually inflated by causation. That's my kind of interpretation. And that's how you might have a, I, but you know, I'm sure any cosmologist listening to this will, will tell me why that's wrong, but it's an interesting idea. If you're thinking about space as being a pseudo, it, it, it's, it's a, an emergent property of time and not the other way around. Um, but, and if, you know, and then our job, if you want to keep the universe alive, our job is to keep causation going, right? For as long as possible, we use all the matter in the universe, get as much energy as we can, keep organizing things, building structures, generating knowledge, and keep the universe inflated. Um, because the universe, if, it, if you think about it, when the universe started, there was no space, there was just time. And this is why the entire universe is non-local. And so when matter was created and the laws of physics were set by that event, all the electrons in the universe were produced because they were produced in the same space. So they were all the same chart, they're all the same thing, right? Protons and neutrons, all this stuff. So they were all unified by this thing. But again, I don't know. I mean, I'd have to think about it more carefully, but I'm certainly an advocate that I don't think, I think space is emergent from time. Now, someone who may be able to come up with us with authority, a guy called Lee Smutlin, is also of the opinion that time is fundamental and space is an emergent phenomenon. And I think he's a much better, he's a cosmologist, a very deep thinking, and the proof is to think he probably has a better way of describing it than I do. I'm also thinking, so here's an even more radical claim, wildly speculative. It's to do with randomness, whether there's true randomness in the universe. You mentioned free will earlier. And just imagine that if you're a panpsychist, if everything is conscious, and if at the most fundamental level, you could exercise free choice, like a particle can choose spin up, spin down. And from our end, without knowledge to that conscious decision, it just appears random, right? And when I first thought this, you know, it's something completely unfalsifiable or unprovable. It takes a wild leap of faith. But then if you take that 
it seems kind of elegant in a weird way because you you also if you're thinking about this hard problem of consciousness where does that emerge from it doesn't really have to come out of unconscious matter you just say it's always there and randomness in the universe which seems extremely weird if you say it's just free will you kind of solve the free will problem as well so i i don't understand any of that and it's not that i don't understand i don't under so the pan psychists say that everything is conscious mm-hmm. so if everything is conscious then nothing is then, then consciousness has no definition and and, it, and the thing is everything is conscious it's clear that what my is happening in my brain is different to everything else and so all that's happening in the pan psychists there's supposed to be some labeling sleight of hand so pan psychists have said yeah everything is conscious it's all graduations Right. What does it explain? Nothing. Okay. What does it kind of give you a framework for? Nothing. So therefore it's just a relabeling of stuff. Now let's go to randomness. The ra- there is no randomness in the universe. The universe is fully deterministic, but here's something that's super odd. Um, it's not determined. Mm-hmm. So we've got this really interesting problem that I think the universe is not random. Can't be. But it's not determined. Why is that? Well, because the universe is growing in size. And it's to do with the combinatorial spaces. So I think free will, all these things are coming from the fact that the universe is growing in, in, in a combinatorial space. But if you do things that basically exceed the, cap- the capacity for the universe to hold the information, something starts to happen where you get a breakdown in um, determinism. And that's because simply there's not enough, there's not enough resource the, the universe has a segmentation problem. It's like a blue, windows, blue screen. If you can, I don't know, you're probably, you're probably now born in a world where your windows never blue screens, but, and so I think that it's something like that. Um, so, and I can, but, but let's go back to the pan psychist view. I really don't understand what they mean. I know Philip Goff quite well. He's a really nice guy. He's a proponent of this, but I, and I respect him, but I don't understand him. And then when I understand him, I'm just like, it doesn't give me anything more. Like you say, it's not falsifiable. So for me, I think consciousness is a quantitatively just ultimately describable and falsifiable thing like life, like the, like, and I think that we will be able to get there now. Is it that matter, all matter, has a property that consciousness has? Yeah. Consciousness is made up of particles. Matter is made up of particles. So I guess there's that, there, but I, I just, I don't know. It's, the thing is, for something to be a powerful explanation for the philosophical framework, philosophically, it should be a science science and give you a framework for, for creating, um, a kind of metaphysics that will lead to some falsifiable conjecture. And if it doesn't, then it's, it is like you say, it's a leap of faith. And why use it? It's like saying, you know, it's like a Rick and Morty episode where we're going to relay the purpose, <laughs> right? And just say, you know, we're just going to do inter- interdimensional TV. It's like, great, but where does that take you? I am and sympathetic to panpsychism. We'll see if, if you talk me out why, of it. Why? By the why? End of this why? One. Why? Why? Well, isn't- I'm going to scattershot a few things that I think are related. I think there's something related to selection. I'll return to that. But then there's also this idea of categorization. Like you could say if if we're taking a determinist view that the universe is one system and things don't really exist within the universe. Like at your level of analysis in chemistry, you can say different chemicals are interacting with each other. But you could also say like, that's just a heuristic that you use with your consciousness to explain it. It's all just like a niche part of this grand universal system moving in one direction. Or you could take more of a bottom up approach and say that what you think are chemical interactions involving like millions of atoms are really just mechanistic beginning one, one particle at a time. And so it's, it's kind of like the everything boils back down to particle physics idea. And neither of those, I think, are wrong. Like whether you say that the universe is one thing and it's the only thing that exists, or if you say fundamental particles are the only thing that really exist, and anything in between that we perceive is really just sort of a a system that you can define as it's including these particles or it's this small subset of the universe system. 
So it's it's related to this idea of to parse out anything as meaningfully distinct in the universe, you need something like consciousness. Um, I, yeah. I think, okay, let's say you say there's this thing called consciousness. It doesn't really explain my consciousness. So now I have to give my consciousness a new label within the universe. And then how do you explain my new label? Because I think I don't see how my consciousness emerges from the lower level consciousness. And so what I'm getting at again is like this kind of, you know, just saying that an ele electron is slightly conscious and a few more. But why is it the rock over there is not conscious at all? I've got the same number of electrons as in my brain and my brain is conscious. I mean, is that rock thinking? Is it like everything, everywhere, all at once? The, the two rocks at the end? Yeah, like when you're, when you're talking about thinking, feeling, self-awareness, I guess the panpsychist isn't talking about any of those as consciousness. They're talking about like those are features, but whatever is fundamental to consciousness is something like information processing. So yeah, in yeah. that sense, a thermostat is conscious. It has a very limited capacity to represent information and it doesn't feel it. It's not self-aware, but it's like on the same continuum. I mean, that's just saying, I mean, panpsychism is another way of saying everything has a quantum number. Uh-huh. Like, yeah. What is that? What is quantum number? So, I mean, if you basically take a molecule and you were to um, look at the elect label, the electrons in the orbitals, they have a different kind of quantum number, right? The Pauli exclusion principle, you know, says everything has to be. So if you have two electrons in a particular orbit, they have a particular label they have to have, right? They can't, you, they can't have the same label. So it's kind of, that's a mathematical description. I, again, it's, I don't... I think that the panpsychism leads to some kind of infinite regress and doesn't actually, doesn't give me the explanatory framework that allows me to act differently. So if I, if I view it like this, I'd say, right, I've got the world without panpsychism, what experiments will I do? The world with panpsychism, what experiments will I do? If I can't, if there's two worlds experimentally are the same, then it's a, it's an interesting concept lacks immediate falsifiability. It's a bit like the concept of God. You can never mm -hmm. say that God doesn't exist. You can't say, you know, it's very difficult to prove that he exists. And so yeah. like, you like, so panpsychism is an, is a, is a philosophical God. Yeah. There's, there's this pattern in my philosophical conversations with friends. Like if I'm defending panpsychism, they're saying you're just expanding the definition of consciousness so much that it's useless. Or similarly, if I say something like God is the set of all natural laws that govern the universe, they're like, well, you're defining God in such an abstract way that it's unfalsifiable, but that's not what people mean when they ordinarily talk about God. I mean, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. I mean, I just don't know. I mean, it's, you know, I, I think that I would have to listen more carefully to the panpsychists and I'm, I'm kind of, you know, I'm, I'm an instrument. I, I guess I'm a physical scientist trying to learn to think. And I, I am kind of um, limited by the fact I like to do experiments. And so if I can't think of an experiment to do, then I'm just like, ah, my brain is too small. I'm going to move on to something else. But when I'm thinking of selection, I think it's related somehow. I think for two reasons. One, that selection is kind of goal directed, it's moving in a particular direction. It's not just random. So there's one thought of, does it have anything to do with, say, like active decision-making, what appears to be randomness, if it's in fact selected, is there some room for agency there? And no. then, no? No, what happens is agency emerges. So I think I understand what you're saying. What drives selection is really hard and really subtle. I, I think I can summarize it. So if you have... If you have um, two objects that come together and they're very weakly bound, right? And um, they could be easily taken apart again. And those two objects that are very weakly bound um, could, so they could be created and decay, created and decay. All that selection is, is the process of creates objects that are resistant to decay over time. And so you need time and you need objects colliding. And the fact that something persists in time, you can look back and go, oh, that persisted. It looks like it was selected, but actually you are imposing your label on that because it survived. And so it's not agency. 
It is just survival in the world. But here's the thing, which I think starts to get exciting for you or interesting is these objects undergo selection, start to get more complicated to, and they start competing and there's a survival of the fittest always. So, you know, so there's a more elaborate things that start to, to, to be creative. Then you start to get to more complex life forms. And then, and then, you know, it's like the, when the fish are in the ocean, they're aware a bit, but they're not that aware because they have to respond really quickly or they get eaten. As soon as the fish finds itself on the sand, they can see a few kilometers. They can see the predator coming towards them. So now they have to start the time to start to go to evolve. Under memory, remember the past because they could see their mate getting eaten. Understand the present and imagine the future. And as soon as you can do those things, remember the past, imagine the future and understand the present, you can act and then agency as we know it emerges through selection because you want to survive. And I think that's kind of an interesting example. I don't think bacteria are particularly active agents. They're pretty dumb, but I would be happy to not join the panpsychists, but have a scale of agency from amoeba all the way up to Shakespeare or your favorite poet. Right. Do you know Carl Friston, Lee? Yeah, I know his work. Yeah. Uh-huh. So yeah, this this all sounds like active inference, this free energy principle idea. And it's also so, sort of predicated on a leap of faith. The only leap of faith is saying that entropy and negative affect are the same thing. But then as soon as you have, the very least, if you start off with life, still a mystery how that got there. But if you start off with something like an amoeba or any self-organizing system that can monitor whatever allows it to either persist over time or what's bad for it, which would be something like entropy increase, then there's a qualitative distinction to that. And that's the beginning of affect. That's the beginning of consciousness in a more meaningful way than the, the loose panpsychist way. Yeah, I think well, the issue with Carl Friston's free energy principle is he keeps mixing up the emergence levels. The same mm -hmm. thing with Jeremy England's emergence principles. The main problem with all these guys and gals that are mixing up their levels because they basically, and they, it's not, they don't rigorously define what's going on at a given system level and come up with a, a, a prediction. So there's this, this free energy principle of the brain, right? Okay, what is it? Explain it to me and give me a tool that is useful to understand it. And, and, so, and so my kind of argument to Carl and to Jeremy and all these guys is like, these are cool ideas. You're taking work, absolutely. You're taking ideas from comp computer science, thermodynamics, and biology and mixing them all together and coming up with a framework basically gives you some nice mathematical ex um, expression, but it's not explanatory. It doesn't predict anything. And it doesn't, uh, it doesn't allow me to, un uh, you know, to come up with a new thing of understanding. It just feels cool because I can bring together my, my intuition of entropy and my intuition of information and my agency. And I'm like, oh, before I know it, I'll I understand the agency in this free energy principle. And I, I think, that, uh, yeah, so, I mean, that's a pretty bold attack. I mean, I mean it with, with the deepest respect and humility, and I'm sure I'm wrong. For me, when people start to generate theories, they have to explain something. They have to solve a problem. Um, I'm really wanting to become a popperian in that regard. And if people are just making stuff, not making stuff up, that's not fair. If they're making relationships across disciplines, that's cool. And it's brave of them. But if they don't solve an existing problem, then I think that probably the thing doesn't exist. What do you make of that earlier idea that to carve out subsystems of the universe, like basically anything more complex than a fundamental particle, but less complex than the entire universe, it almost seems like you could draw arbitrary boundaries around any system of matter. And they're not completely arbitrary because some things are stable across time. But I can't get away from this idea that do things the way that we think of them really exist out there without sort of placing these conscious boundaries? Or when we say that selection is happening like on an object or on an agent, is it really just the product of some more bottom up particle physics that we don't understand. And it's a heuristic to call it selection, to call it object. 
No, I think there's something else going on that we don't understand. And I think the same principle that we don't understand um, basically explains the transition between dead and living matter, number one. It explains the transition between um, uh, kind of uh, information processing in biology and the generation of agency, number two. It then starts to uh, explain the generation of abstraction, right? And then consciousness. So there's, there, there's one principle that we don't understand that is controlling all of these and it's fascinating. And that's why, um, uh, Carl Friston, Philip Goff, and, uh, Jeremy England, all these guys, they're not wrong to propose ideas because they're capturing this, this like, yeah, what is going on? Here's something missing. I think that, but, but what we've got to do is be very, very precise about what it is we're trying to understand and go deeply. And that's why, you know, my collaborators and I are kind of thinking about this carefully, but I think it's the same principle. And I think selection is, an em I mean, emergence is a funny word and we have to redefine physics with assembly theory anyway, right? Because everyone's thinking about point particles and laws and things. I think that's wrong. I think we have to think in terms of existence and causation and the ability to, uh, uh, the, and, and you're right to draw a boundary. I think I like that. So if you draw a boundary, if you take a, so here's a quick take back. So what you want is what is the minimum boundary I can draw around some objects so they can work together to persist in time and space, number one, then act on other matter to basically duplicate themselves. So they can replicate like the selfish matter to get towards the selfish gene. And then there's this quantitative jumps in information processing that you're seeing, right? As you have these boundaries. So yeah, if you draw the boundary on the entire universe, you've got all the alien civilizations in the universe, all the Shakespeare's, all this cool stuff, the quantum computers, that's not particularly helpful. If you go down to Proton, that's not particularly helpful either. So then you're saying, okay, how far out do I go in space and time to capture those processes? And what are the, what is happening in these regions that are allowing them to basically, um, produce this incredible complexity and kind of agency and consciousness and all that other stuff. And, and I think it, the driving force for all of this is selection and evolution. And the universe is just basically using energy and matter to make is an arms race with itself to basically make more and more interesting objects that can explore the, 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 the combinatorics of the universe. My hint to you is I think where the, the, what assembly theory points to where kind of consciousness, free will, or the arrow time, all these things come from is the fact assembly theory is about quantifying combinatoric causal structures in what otherwise would have been combinatorial explosions. And I think there is a very interesting phenomenon that I'm working on with my, my colleagues in particular, Sarah Walker, at ASU, and it would appear that where the universe is combinatorial is expanding, getting bigger, we can say it's combinatorially getting larger. But if we if in a given region of the universe, we can cause a combinatorial explosion that is bigger than the combinatorial explosion of the universe, something very interesting happens because the universe doesn't have the, let's call it, I hate doing this, but let's do it for fun. You'll love it. Probably it lacks the computational capacity to compute with the laws of physics about what's going to happen precisely. So mm -hmm. that's where the regions of novelty emerge so, and the, and that mechanism, we're just about understanding with assembly theory. And that seems incompatible with simulation theories. Correct. That's, and you can't simulate the universe. That's really interesting. Basically I can, I can, I can, I mean, it can't, you can never prove like the same, you can never disprove the simulation, but here's the argument. If probably possible to simulate parts of the past because they're so much smaller than the universe is now. And you can then build a big enough computer to contain everything and do it all. And then you can simulate it for sort of all time. But there is this fundamental problem whereby when the, when the size of the problem is bigger than the universe itself, you cannot compute it. And if you cannot compute it, you break, that's where determines and breaks down without randomness. And that's what we don't understand. I can tell you it's really bashing my head in because that's the answer to a lot of these it, things we're seeing and that 
The universe is fully deterministic looking back into the past, totally not deterministic going into the future. Why? It's because the universe is always creating combinatorial explosions that cannot be contained within it. And that, and that, and that, and then selection has to act. Is that why people predict a heat death? Because the only way to accommodate for an ever increasing size would be for the complexity, the amount of interactions to go down to such a point that nothing happens. So then the computational resources or the, the complexity is manageable. Would say so. And I, and I'm, you know, the only in data we have right now is pretty compelling is that we have an expanding universe. And indeed it's accelerating its expansion. We don't really know what's going on outside of the last 50 years or hundred years of cosmology and snapshots we're playing. Right. And, every, and, and all the time we're finding weird stuff going on. So I, I think that it's super interesting. We, you know, wouldn't it be interesting if understanding anomalies on the cosmological scale help us understand what consciousness is at the quantum scale. Thank you, Lee. I, I'm really glad that from such diverse disciplines, we can make sense of this and talk at a level of abstraction that I feel like I understand what's going on in chemistry. Yeah, I think it's, 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 it, 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 there are points where when you're crossing the disciplines, if you mix up language and metaphor and so on, that you can lose rigor. But I think it's worth trying and communicating and trying to figure out what's going on because, you know, the, the unification across quantum mechanics, you know, Church Turing, Deutsch principle, evolution, and knowledge generation, you know, I think it's like Dave, what David has in his fabric of reality. You have to be able to go between quite interesting disciplines to make sense of reality. And so what people are realizing, you have to be able to step across those disciplines to make progress. And we shouldn't shy away from it, even if we do end up, you know, talking out of our pay grades or what we even had training for, because then the, the the experts can say, no, no, that's wrong because of this reason or this this fact and this experiment, and then it can update you. But I think we would be all the, the poorer if we didn't try. And I think it's fun, that wild speculation. I mean, they, they do train you in, in the PhD program. Like you want to be really rigorous and evidence-based and sort of try and discourage you from that wild speculation. I sort of compartmentalize it on this podcast. I encourage anarchy in my research group with my PhD. So I have organized anarchy and anarchy is not putting the, the lab down and making meth in the basement. Anarchy is about thinking things, breaking dogma, asking why is this imposed and just going through in a safe space what the, what the, what you do. And I would think that we should, this in science more, we should create safe spaces, intellectually safe spaces where more anarchy can occur. And then we can criticize the ideas that come out of that. I think we'll make much more progress and humanity owes it to itself for a little bit of scientific anarchy. Thank you very much for your time, Lee. Thank you.